face and some of you, I can't see your face. Nevertheless, I know that you are here and you're participating, which is a good thing. Um, it's not, um, it's not um, uh, for me, it's, it's a little weird that um, we continue to do Zoom services um, in, and instead of being in person, like, you know, in person, one-on-one -on -one in the church, never in the building where we can see each other and touch each other. Nevertheless, I am thankful for that for you all here today. And um, in-person service should be resumed next week, Sunday. Next week, Sunday, we go back to our building and uh, we will conduct in-person service, service, in service there. But I thank you all for tuning on this morning. And um, I have something that I really, really want to just share with you and just to encourage you this morning as it relates to what's going on around us, the thing that's so bothers us, bother us and the things that we are struggling with. I want to talk to you this morning about faith. Faith. And uh, if I'm going to use for a topic this morning, I'm going to talk about failing faith. Failing faith. Anything that fails, it goes down or it, um, it withers away or it goes away. Failing faith. I want to talk to you about failing faith this morning and what you can do as it relates to failing faith. Uh, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of uh, St. Luke, St. Luke chapter 22. And we're going to be reading from verse 20, verse 31. And we'll be reading from verse 31 to verse 34. 34 verse, St. Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 31 to verse 34. Here begin at the reading of God's holy word. And the Lord said unto Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So far the scripture. Let us pray. Almighty God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your word, Lord God. I thank you for the desire and the unction of the anointing to preach your word, Lord God. Father, I come to you this morning and I say I'm void of the faculties with which to do the task that is set before me. But Lord, you are able. You are the God that gives me the ability to do it. So Father, I come to you this morning. I ask, O oh God, that Holy Spirit be the anointing rest upon this thy faltering servant. Lord, that you send the anointing that makes teaching, preaching easy. Father, illuminate my mind. Grant unto this thy servant, Lord God, the tongue of the learned. Lord, to precision, precision of expression, Lord God. Father, I to bend this will that it may conform to your will to do only what you want me to do and to say only what you want me to say this day. Almighty God, as I pray this morning, I pray for the hearts of your people that they may be in tune to you, Lord God, to hear, to listen, to understand and comprehend what you're trying to say to us. Spirit of the living God, I ask you to come right now and take over all that goes on here. Just have your way in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In order for you to understand where I'm going, I must first give you a background in a sense. I'm talking about faith this morning. And when it relates to faith, you might ask, what is faith? When we talk about faith, faith is, uh, in Hebrew, in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 1, it teaches us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it, but you believe in it. Faith is basically the foundation, the foundation of anything that is built on. Faith is a belief, an assurance, fidelity. Faith is a persuasion. It is a confidence, a moral conviction, a religious truth. That's what faith is. Faith is a reliance upon Christ. Faith, you have faith. People say, I have faith in God. I have faith on Christ. Faith is abstractly constancy in such a profession. It is the truth itself, an assurance, a belief, a fidelity. In other words, the word, there's a Greek, there's a Greek word for, for faith. It's called pistis, P-I-S-T. 
T-I-S. It actually means a conviction. I believe this thing. It is a relating, it's, it's relating to God in a sense that he is. It's a conviction that God exists, a belief that God exists. This is what faith is. And in this sense, in the Bible, the first time that the word faith is mentioned is actually in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. The Bible calls a generation who has no faith. It says, you're a generation of no faith. Then it goes on into Habakkuk, and it talks about the just. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about the just, how they should live. It said the just should live by faith, live by the persuasion that God exists. Live by the persuasion. Let this be the foundation that you live by, the persuasion, the foundation that you build everything on. It goes on in Matthew, and the, the third time it's used in Matthew 6, verse 30, it talks about little faith. Then in Matthew 8, 10, it talks about great faith. Then again in Matthew 8, verse 26, it goes back and it talks again about little faith. Then in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, it speaks about visible faith, a faith that can be seen, how God expresses, or how people expresses a faith that can be seen. In Matthew 9, verse 22, it talks about the trying of your faith, just to try your faith. And we are living in a world today where things, we look around you, everything just try you. You just, you, 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 you go out in the morning and you meet people that really try your faith. You go through situations and circumstances and you believe, it, it just makes you wanna, sometimes it makes you wanna give up. Sometimes it makes you want to just throw in the towel and just call it quit. However, when you really believe in God, it's difficult for you to quit. Because quitting means that, listen, God is not coming true for me, it's not gonna exist. So you do what you wanna do and you just throw in the towel and say, I can't believe this thing anymore. As for me, I'll never quit because I believe that God exists. I also believe that not only does he exist, I believe that he knows everything that's going on with us, that he tries us. In, 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 um, in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 32, where we read this morning, it says, Jesus Christ said, but I pray, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Well, let me look into this a little while. I want to just, just dip, dip into this a little while and give you a little background where I'm going with this. In Luke chapter 22, verse 24, the Bible said there was, a, there was also strife among the, among the disciples. Jesus gathered with his disciples and there was strife. Actually, when the Bible talks about strife in this section, it's actually talking about a quarrel. There was bickering. There was a contention among the disciples. And if you notice the scripture, it says they were, they were contention, they were arguing who is going to be the greatest. Then, you know, they, 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 I mean, it's a simple thing. Everyone want a position and they're, they're crying. Stay with me. They're crying. They're, they're arguing with each other who is going to be the greatest. In the English language or the, in the English language, you hear great, greater, greatest. None of them wanted to be great. They all going to end up being great, but none of them want to be great. None of them want to be greater. They all want to be the greatest. So there was a contention among them. Who's going to be the greatest? And as this contention go on, the Bible said that Jesus Christ heard and he, he perceived what they were arguing about. And then he turned to them and he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles, the ones that are not called, the, 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 not, not the ones that are not chosen, exercise a leadership over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Benefactor, he puts it in a way like, there are people who rule over you and they benefit from what you do. Like your boss on the job, you work for him. And he benefits, he gets a credit, but you do the work. You know, they, they talk about benefactors. Then Jesus Christ went on to them and he said, but ye shall not be so. But he that is great, he says, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief among you, chief as he that does serve. Jesus Christ 
take the old conversation and the, the wrangling that they were having, and he brought it back into perspective. He said, he said, I understand you all want to be the greatest, but in order to be, to be the greatest, you must subject yourself to be the younger. And this sense when he talks about the younger, we know that in the Bible, when he talks about the younger and the older, you know that the, the older one always get the preeminence. The older child gets the preeminence. The older child is normally the child that gets the double blessing and uh, is, is, is the heir of the, the blessings of the father. You know, when, when, when the goods are being passed or just before father died, he would normally give the older child the double blessing and the, the, the younger child or the second child will get the next uh, what's coming on the line. So Jesus Christ is saying to them, if you want to be the greatest, you subject yourself to be the less. In other words, don't ride so high or rush so high to be on top and exercise lordship over other people. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying, humble yourself. He went on to say, if you want to be great, he says, be willing to serve. The servant never really considered himself over the master. The master is the one who calls the shot and he served. Jesus Christ, if you want to be great, begin to serve. And many of us in society, we don't really want to serve. We prefer to, for someone to serve us because then it means that we don't have to do all the work on all of these stuff. So people are going to serve us. If you look in Matthew, in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, it says, he says, ye, he says, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptation. Jesus Christ is saying to the disciples, you disciples, you have continued with me in my temptation. You have seen all that I've gone through, who have been tempted, or have overcome temptation. I want you to emulate me. I want you to follow me. When you are tempted, I want you to overcome. And then he goes on to say in, in verse uh, 29, he says, And I appointed unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me. He's saying to them, all of you are going to get kingdom. I've appointed all of you a kingdom, and you're going to get it. Might not be in this life. You're all going to be great in this life. And in the life to come, I've appointed all of your kingdom in my father's house. And you're going to get it. But then he went on in verse 30 and he says, that ye may eat and drink at, the, at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's telling the disciples that it's okay. You all are appointed a kingdom. You all are going to be able to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to be sitting on thrones. You're going to be, 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 be exalted above what you are now. So there's no need to be fighting. But when you look at verse 31, here's where the rubber hits the road. Hear what Jesus Christ says. And the Lord said unto Simon, si he said, said unto Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan has desired to have thee that he may sift you as wheat. From the context of this text, uh, when he said, and the Lord said unto Simon, it, would, it, would, it, would, it is right for us to conclude that Simon was probably one of those who were arguing of who is going to be the greatest. And in that sense, Jesus Christ addressed Simon. He said, and the Lord said, Simon, si Simon, Simon. Behold, I mean, look, Satan has desired to have thee that he may sift you as wheat. Before I go there, I want to turn over and show you something here in a little while. Why Jesus Christ probably, why it, the, the, the scholars conclude that it was Simon? Because Simon seemed like he had a great insight into Jesus, into who Jesus Christ was. Verse 14, go up to verse 14. And they said, and, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, and others the prophet. Go back down out of 15, Kevin. He says, he said unto them, but whom ye, whom say ye that I am? Go down to 50, 60 now. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Go to 17 and 18 now. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father. In other words, Simon Peter had such an insight into who Christ was. So he said more or less, you know, if I had this kind of insight, it would only be fair that I should be the greatest. Because when the question was asked, none of you answered. 
The question was posed to all of them, but only Simon came up with the correct answer. And Jesus Christ said to Simon, Simon, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father. In other words, Simon, you have tapped into something that you have tapped into something that the ordinary person, your other fellows, the, the, your fellow brethren, the fellow disciples, they haven't tapped into it. So Simon, you have, you, you have placed yourself in an echelon, in another level where they're not yet, they have not yet arrived to that level. You have a, a position yourself in a level where my father is not revealing things to you. So Simon, you're up there. So it will be it would be wise, I said, it would be fair for us to conclude that Simon was one of those who was, was uh, arguing in Luke chapter 23, verse uh, 20, 22, verse 32. The Bible said that Jesus Christ said unto him, Simon, Simon. And when you hear the, in anywhere in the scripture where your name is called twice, it's a sense of witness. It's an urgency. So it's another words, it's as if the, it's an urgent call. Like, watch out. What are you doing? So in this sense, with Jesus Christ saying to him, Simon, Simon, it's as if they were they were quarreling to the extent where Jesus Christ had to interrupt them. Simon, Simon. And it seems that like he was he was like lauding himself and pushing the conversation. So Jesus had to talk his to Simon, Simon, look, Satan has desired to have thee that he may sift thee as wheat. When I look into this text and I begin to look at it, when the Bible said that Simon, Simon, Satan has desired thee, the word for the, the, the Greek word that he uses for desire is the word e x a i t e o m a x to me i. It's a Greek word, and it actually means demand, desire. To, to, it, it means to request, to ask for. So Jesus Christ is telling us it's, it's like a demand. It says, Satan seeks to see, ask me for you. Simon, Satan asks me for you. He's demanding for me to give you to him. He's demanding for me to lift off my hands off of you and let him have you. <laughs> In other words, Simon, Satan is begging me. He's begging me. He is asking for you. And this tells me that the devil cannot do anything with us except God give him the permission. It's the same thing that you'll find over in Job chapter 1, verse 6, when the, the Bible said that Satan went to God and demanded Job. He said, okay, give me him, let me test him. But in this case, Satan is asking for God, for Jesus Christ, to give him Peter, not to hurt him, but to test him. If you look at it, it says, he says, Simon, Simon, Look, Satan has desired to have thee, to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. In other words, Satan asks God, asks Jesus Christ for Simon. And the request being made, do you know that in the spirit realm, there's a whole lot of things that's going on in the spirit realm that we don't know about. There are so many germs floating around us and we don't see them, but yet God protect us. We go out in the morning and we don't know what, what, what danger God has protected us from. But there are things that's going on in the spirit realm that you don't even know. The Bible said in Job, the Bible said the sons of God came to him and, and God said, where have you been? And, he, and Satan also appeared and God said, where have you been? He said, I've been going through and through the earth. And in the, in the interpretation, he said, I've been having victory. And Jesus Christ said, no. God said, no, you haven't been having victory. Have you considered my servant Job? He's upright, a man that escheweth evil. A man that, you know, even though you provoke me, a man that doeth good. And then Satan said, oh, really? He said, you, do you think Job served you for naught? He only served you because he's getting benefit from you. Haven't you placed a hedge of protection around him on all that he have? But lift the edge of protection around him and, and, and give him to me and see if he won't curse you. Same thing here with Simon. Simon, the devil is saying to Jesus Christ, give me him, let me test him. Let me prove to you that he's no good. Let me prove to you that he is 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 never is 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 of no use to you. Give me give me him. Let me try him for you. But there's a little trick with that. If you look at verse Luke chapter twenty two verse thirty two, it says, "But I have prayed for you." But before I get to thirty two, I want you to look back up at thirty one. He says that he may sift you as wheat. If you know anything about grains. You know that you don't sift wheat. 
Wheat in its raw state, you cannot be, you cannot you can't push it through a sieve. You can't sift it through a sieve. Wheat in its raw state with the kernel and everything on it. You have to beat the wheat in a, in a, in a pestle, in a mortar. You got to beat it first or in a mill. And when what comes out of the mill, then you put it in a strainer and you sift it. And what comes out of the strainer that you use. So when you put wheat in its raw stray, in, in, in its raw state in a strainer, you shake it around. You just make it, make it unsteady. You're frustrating it. So here's what Satan is saying. God is saying. Satan seeks to have you to frustrate you. He wants to frustrate you. Could it be that some of the things that we are going on, that we are going on, you know, we have going on in our life, the enemy is trying us, trying to frustrate you, trying to get you to give up on God, trying to get you to turn away from God and to and forget about even your faith in God. Could it be that this trouble you are having, the bills, you can't pay him all the bills, and he's saying, give up, God is not helping you. Could it be some of the sickness that you're going through, Satan is seeking to frustrate you and make you say, telling you, and I don't know, many of us get this whisper in our ears, God don't love you. And worse for all, if you fail, if you drop, the, if you fail and you, 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 you mess up, Satan said, how could you be a Christian and you do that? You're not a Christian. You're not saved. And all of these things playing in your mind, and you figure more or less, you begin to say, oh, God don't really love me. If God had loved me, then I wouldn't be going through this poppycock. It's foolishness. God loves you. So Jesus Christ said, I want you to look at the, the passage again. Jesus Christ said, he wants to frustrate you like wheat. want to shake you up, keep you unsteady, get you off your feet, knock you down, get your back up here. You want to keep you unsteady. But when you look at um, verse, uh, verse 32, hear what Jesus Christ said. In other words, Jesus having the inside scoop of what's going on. He says, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail it not. He's saying to Peter, Peter, I know something that's going on. You might not know what's going on in the spirit realm, Peter, but see it and seek to sift you as weak man. He tried to turn you around. He tried to mess you up. But see, hey, Peter, I prayed for you. I want you to turn with me over to St. John chapter 17. I want to show you something. St. John chapter 17. I'm going to get back to it in a little while to this particular text in a little while, but I want to take you to St. John chapter 17, and I want you to look at verse 14. We're going to read from verse 14 to verse 20. St. John 17, verses 14, verse 20 to 20 says, I, it says, uh, I have given them thy word. This is Jesus Christ talking now. He says, I have given them thy word, and the word has, the and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, he says, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he goes on, he says, sanctify them through thy, through thy truth. And then he says, thy word is truth. Then he goes on in verse 18 and he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And he says in verse 19, as uh, he says, and for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through, through the truth. Then he goes on in verse 20, which is where I want to get to. He says, neither pray I for these only alone, talking to the disciples, talking to, he, this is Jesus Christ praying to the Father for the disciples. But then he said, I'm not only praying for the disciples, he praying for you too. Hear what he says in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the word that you're reading here that the disciples wrote, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do you believe on it? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died, that he rose again from the dead, and that he's alive? If you believe this and you are saved, then you are saved. And if you believe this and you are saved, this prayer, Jesus Christ said, I prayed for you because you believe because of what you, you, you believe because of what the disciples say. So here's what Jesus Christ is saying. I prayed for you. Let's go back over to St. Luke. Let's go back over to St. Luke again. St. Luke chapter 22. And look at it. He said, but I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. 
You remember when I just started, I told you what faith is? Faith is a foundation. Jesus Christ said, I'm, I prayed for you, Peter, that your foundation, your belief, your fidelity, the thing that you build your hope on, your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm praying, I prayed for your faith, Peter, that your faith don't fail. And then he went on and he says, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Jesus Christ knew actually what was going to happen to Peter. In other words, he knew that his prayer for Peter is going to be answered. He didn't say, I want you to look at the text. He didn't say, and if you look at it, it says, and when the word converted, he didn't say, and if you are converted, he didn't say that. If we leave it up to chance, he didn't say, and I think that you're going to be converted. He didn't say, I think that. He didn't say, and probably when you're converted, he didn't say that. He didn't say you might converted. He didn't say, I think you're going to con you're converted. He didn't say there's a chance that you're going to be converted. He said, when thou art converted, meaning that it's a foregone conclusion. The decision has already been made that you are going to be converted. And this is what I want you to do, Peter, when you're converted. I want you to strengthen the brethren. Because you're going to go through some things, Peter, and you're going to get strong. And when you get strong, there's some other brethren that are going to go through some stuff. And I want you to strengthen them. Hear what Peter said. And many of us have good intentions. Have you ever had wonderful intentions? You say, I never do that. Oh, I'm going to follow Jesus to the end. And I'm going to do, oh, man, I'm saved. And I'm sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm going to follow Jesus all the days of my life. I'm going to be a Christian. I'll never fail. I'll never be left. I mean, no, no. Jesus is the man. I mean, Jesus is my God. I'm never going to go back. I'm never going to turn back. I'm going to follow Jesus. He turns right. I'm going to turn right. He goes up. I'm going to go up. He goes down. I'm going to go down. He goes left. I'm going to go left. Wherever Jesus go, I'm going to follow him. I have a purpose in your heart that that's what you're going to do. And uh, the rubber hits the road and you wonder sometimes that, oh my God, how did I get here? Why did I do that? You have failed. I talked to you this morning about failing faith. That's what I want to talk to you about, failing faith. I want to encourage you, don't beat upon yourself. When you fail, get up again, dust yourself off and keep trying. Don't lay down. The Bible said that the righteous fall seven times and rise it again. The wicked fall but once and is forgotten. I want you to notice something with this passage. It says the righteous fall seven times. The one who's doing the right thing, he fall on more than the wicked. He said the wicked fall but once and is forgotten or would the wicked fall into mischief. But the righteous one, if you're one of those who keep falling down and getting up, just pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm righteous, man. I keep getting up. I can't stand down. I can't stay down. Notice the wicked fall on once and it's forgotten. The righteous person fall on more than the wicked. But if you're one of those who are keep getting up, keep getting up, baby, keep trying again. So let's get back to the text. Hear what he's saying. He said, and when you're strong, when you're strengthened, Peter, not if you're going to be strengthened. When you're converted, when you when you when when you overcome, converted mean when you change your mind, when you turn around, when you returned. Mm. Peter, I prayed for you. When you revert to what you know, when you revert from what you believe. When you come back around, when you wise up, Peter, when you begin your transitive journey back to me, Peter, when you return back to me. <laughs> In this case, when Jesus is saying to Peter, when you return to me, Peter, I want you to strengthen the brethren. But here Peter responds. Peter is actually saying, I never left you. Listen to this. Look at verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. This is what Peter is saying. You're talking about me leaving you. You're talking about me converting. I'm already converted. I'm ready. I'm re Lord, I'm ready to go to, I'm ready to die for you. I'm ready to go to prison for you. And I'm ready to die for you. I mean, we talk bold at times. Have you ever said anything that I'll never do that? My bishop, my late bishop, Bishop McKinley, God bless him. One time I said to me, I'll never do that. He says, Carol, don't say that. Say, I hope I will never do that. I pray that I never resort or do that. 
Don't say never because circumstances can put your back against the wall. And the very thing that you say you wouldn't do, you end up doing it. And all the guilt that comes over you when you do it, make you feel like, oh, God, don't want me anymore. I don't want, I, I, I failed him. But oh, I thank Jesus Christ that he knows the past, the present, and the future. He knows everything about us. So when Peter was in his braggadocious state and said, Lord, I'm ready, I'm ready to go to prison for you. You know what he says? Lord, he says, Lord, meaning master. The word that he used for Lord is, is the word, is the word, the word that he used, that, that Peter used here for Lord is kurios. Kurios, the Greek word, kurios. K-U, it says K-U-R-I-O-S. And it actually means boss. It means, it means master. It means Lord. It means ruler, the owner. You own me, Lord. Master, I'm ready to ready to go with thee, both in prison and to death. So Peter is saying, Lord, if they lock you up, I, I, they, they're going to have to lock me up too. And Lord, if they kill you, they're going to have to kill me too. I mean, that's an assurance that you have a friend with you. <laughs> oh, whatever I go to, my friend will hang with me. But I thank God that God knows the future, the past, the present, and the future. He knows everything about us. <laughs> We're talking about failing fate. Look what Jesus said to him. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Jesus Christ said, Peter, you're bragging and you're telling me you're ready to go to prison? You're ready to die with me, Peter? Peter? <laughs> Let me tell you a little something else about Peter again. I want to show you something about Peter. Go over to... I want you to look at something about Peter. I'm going to see, show you how Peter is. Look at St. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Turn with me for me, son. I'm going to get back to the text in a while. St. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. He says, then he says, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the town of Caesarea Philippi. By the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Who do we men say that I am? Go back down to 28 and 29, our son. Who do men say that I am? This is a question that Jesus is asking again. And they answered, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, others say. Uh, 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 one of the one of the, one of the others say we are one of the prophets. Go back down a more. One is you're one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom ye whom say ye that I am? In other words, you have walked with me, you have talked with me, you have ate with me. You see me turn the, you see me fed the multitude, you see the miracles that I work, you see me heal the sick, you see me raise the dead, you see me cast out devils. You're telling me what men are saying that I'm one of the prophets. Men are saying I'm John the Baptist. But you who have hung with me, who do you say that I am? You, you're familiar with me. Who do you say that I am? And then Peter again answered, Thou art the Christ. You find this testimony of Peter in Luke 9, verse 18 again, where Peter is professing just previously, Luke 9, 18. Turn there for me if you have. Say Luke 9, verse 18. And it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Who said the people that I am? Go right down to 19 now. He's asking, he first he asked them, What are the people saying about me? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, mean Elijah, and others others say uh, others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. Go back down to twenty now. He says, he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And here again, Peter again answered and said, the Christ. I want you to notice. I'm getting somewhere with this. But I want you to keen in. I want you to zero in on what I'm trying to get to you. Peter had great insight. Now, if you turn to St. John chapter 6, I want to show you something. We're talking about Peter. St. John chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 51 and show you something here. I am the, light, uh, it says, I am the living bread which cometh down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give 
is my flesh, which I will give to the life, give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat my flesh and my, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye shall not, ye shall have no life in you. Whoso, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And the living, he says, and the living Father, he says, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth my eateth me, even he shall live by me. Look at verse 58, he says, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, not as your father did eat manna, and, and are dead. But he says, He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue, as he taught in Capernaum. Listen to verse 60 now, he says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can he hear it? When Jesus knew it, knew in himself that his disciple murmured at, at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What do if ye shall see the Son of Man ascended up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profited nothing. The word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But they are, he says, but there are some of you that believe not. Look at, look at the, first, the preceding uh, 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 word. He says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray him. Look at verse 65. And he said, therefore, and he said, therefore, said I unto you that no man can come to me, come unto me, except it were given unto him by the Father. Verse 60, 60 I'm going to go all the way up to, I'm going to, re, go, I'm going to go all the way up to 71, and then you get, and then I explain to you where I'm going. He says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus Christ, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And from that time, many of his disciples didn't walk with him anymore. He said, then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? It's a question. I ask you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many of them left. And he asked him, are you going to be leave like the rest of them? Are you going to leave? And look again who answered. Look at the response. Look at the person who responded in verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. And look at it. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is the devil? <laughs> Let's go back over to Luke 22, where we were before. I want to show you something. When you look at Peter's lifestyle and Peter, Peter's closeness with God, Peter had insight into who God is. Peter had revelation knowledge of who God is, of who Jesus Christ was. So he could speak freely and tell you, you are the Christ, I know it. You are the Christ. Not, on the, not just the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And I, he placed emphasis on the living God because what they were coming down, if you look at it earlier on, they were coming down the road of Caesarea Philippi. And in, on the road of Caesarea Philippi, you have all, it was it's named after Philip, one of Herod's son. And, uh, and, and, and on both sides of the road of uh, Caesarea Philippi, they were the boss of the Roman, the Roman, the Roman, the rulers, the Caesars that were that dead, they died. And they would have on big poles or big columns the bust of the Caesars. And people said they would call the Caesars gods. 
So on that road, Caesarea Philippi, it was lined with many of the Caesars who died before. And the people would revere those, those busts and say, oh, that, that one was a God, this one was a God. And Jesus Christ said, if they are God, who do men say that I am? <sighs> and the one that answered was Peter. Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And he went all over in John. He said, and I, we are sure, we are sure, we are persuaded that you are the Christ. We're talking about failing faith this morning. We know that you are the, I know that you are the Christ. And I noticed none of the others answered, just Peter. I know that you are the Christ. I know that you are the son of the living God. Peter had inside knowledge. So even with inside knowledge, Jesus Christ said, Peter, with this inside knowledge you have, Satan still seek to sift you as wheat. Satan still seek to frustrate you, Peter, but I've prayed for you. And then Jesus Christ said to him, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. This is verse 34. Then I want you to look at something where the scripture fulfilled. Ah, I tell you. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you the word of God. If you look at, say, Luke chapter 25. Look at verse, sorry, Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, and I want to show you something. Look at um, verse 52. Then said Jesus unto the chief priests and captain of the, of the temple, the elders, which were come out to him, be ye come out as against a thief with the sword. Want to show you something before I get there. Let me go back up. Just bear with me a little bit. Uh huh. Want to show you something. Look at verse 49. When they were, it says, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And of course, again, scholars say that this was Peter again that was arguing. Shall I smite them with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest, cut off his ears, his right ears. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ears and it was, and he healed him. I want you to look at something in a minute. Let me just find it for you and give it to you so you can look at it and you can see for yourself. This was Peter that cut off the man's ears. Let me see if I find it for you. Hold on a minute. When the, when the Lord said to Peter, Peter, put up your sword. Put it up, Peter. Don't, 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 don't. don't. What, what, I must be here. This, put, put, put up your sword, Peter. Peter was the one who chopped off. The, as a matter of fact, the scholars will tell you, he wasn't really going for the ear. He was going for the neck. But he missed him getting the ear. And the Lord said, put up your sword, Peter. <laughs> So with this, Peter is pledging a fidelity to Jesus, close to Jesus. So even when you pledge a fidelity to Jesus and close to Jesus, things can befall, befall you that makes you wonder and make you cringe with your faith in Jesus. I want to show you something. Stay with me. Stay with me. Look at Luke chapter 22, look at verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid behold, beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. This is the maid accusing Peter. This is when they brought Jesus Christ now into Pilate's judgment all. They arrested him and Peter tried to chop off an ear and Peter followed them. I mean, I mean, he's following Jesus and now he's, he can't go inside, but he's out there warming himself by the fire. A maid look, recognize him, a woman recognized him. Oh, this one was with him too. Look at verse 57. And he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. Do you remember what Jesus Christ tell him? Do you remember what Jesus Christ said? 
in, in, in Luke 22, verse 34, he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Go back down again. That's the first time. Peter said, I don't know him. And after, look at verse 58. And after a little while, another, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. Peter said, you don't know what you're talking. I'm not. He told him, mate, no, I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't know him. Peter said, I don't know him. This is the same Peter who identified Jesus Christ and said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And I know, and I'm sure. He didn't just say, I know. He said, I know, and I'm sure. When Jesus Christ said, would you also go away? He said, where will we, we go? Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And I am sure, and we know that you are the Christ. We talk about failing faith this morning. Hang with me. Then you look at verse 59. It says, and about the space of an hour, another conf confidently affirmed saying, of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know, I, he says, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he spake, the cock crew. And then you look at verse 22, verse 6, Luke 22, verse 61. Right after the cock crow, verse 22, verse 61, he says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, three times. And the Bible said, verse 62, And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What are some of the things that cause you to make your faith tremble? Make you feel like, oh God, I fail God. And many of us, I can't live a Christian life because I'm a failure. I pledge that I'm going to follow Jesus. And in all my effort of following Jesus, I am struggling. My faith is making me feel like my faith is waning. My faith is being tried. My faith is being tested. I don't feel like I can go on. Let me encourage you this morning. Even though your faith might be failing, Jesus Christ is not leaving you. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you, even unto the ends of the world. What are some of the things that make you feel ashamed? And oftentimes the enemy will play it over in your mind when you fail and you mess up. You, you get up and you try and you fall down again. I can't do it anymore. Oh man, I can't. And many, if you, if you talk to many, many, many secular believers who are not Christian, they said, man, I, I don't want to give my life to Christ, man, because when I give my life to Christ, you know, when I become a Christian, I want to make sure that, man, I can, I can live it because I don't want to turn back. And people are fearful that when they start serving Christ, when they become a Christian, they're going to mess up. What they're saying to you that when I become a Christian, when I become a Christian and following Christ, I don't want to mess up, so I don't want to do it now. Because of that, many men and many women, many boys, many girls, many men, many women, many people decide I'm not going to become a Christian because to be a Christian, I need to walk righteous. I need to live a righteous life. And I don't know if I have the ability to live a righteous life. I don't know if I have the ability to carry it through to the end. But my friend, I want you to take a page from what Jesus Christ said. He said, Peter, you confess me as Lord. You confess that, Peter, I am the Christ, the son of the living God. You did that, Peter. You, 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 you are insight. And many of us are walking today. We know we have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, but we are timid to go all the way because you're afraid you're going to mess up. Jesus Christ said, Peter, what you're going to go through with the devil is going to frustrate you. So my friends, I'm telling you this morning, what you're going through this morning, the trying of your faith, is just to let you know that, listen, Satan is trying to sift you as wheat. But Jesus Christ said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. Keep trying. Keep getting up again.
because the time is going to be is time is going to come when you are indeed going to be strengthened and all that experience that you have had you're falling down you're getting up you're messing up you're turning back you're doing all kind of mess all that experience you have you're going to be able to use that experience to strengthen those that are going through the same things that you are going through even now coronavirus. I haven't been into church for a while. Oh man, I'm on this Zoom time. I feel so much better when I'm in church. I feel the presence of God. I feel like I'm around brethren and I'm cool and I, I can say hallelujah and everybody can see me worship and everybody can see me clap my hand and everyone can see me praise and give God the glory. My friends, God is still with you. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I messed up. My friend, God has not forgotten you. But pastor, I don't know. I, I don't feel like God, God loves me because I keep messing up. I keep messing up. I keep falling down and getting up. And the devil, keeps, something just keeps telling me that God don't want me no more. My friend, the battle that you're having, it's your mind, mind that's telling you that God doesn't love you. It's the devil that's accusing you because he's the accuser of the brethren. He tells you that you're no good. He tells you that you'll never make it. Look at you. Look what you did. Look, look what you. As a matter of fact, look what you did yesterday. Look what you did last night. Oh man, you could never be saved and did that, my friend. He is the accuser of the brethren, and this is one of the reasons why he's saying, "Lord, let me test him. Give him. Let me test him, my friend. Let him test you. You might even deny Jesus, but run back to him. Don't run away from him." The Bible said that. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he said to the disciples, go tell the people that, that came to the tomb. He says, go tell my disciple. Go tell my disciple and Peter. Because you can imagine how Peter must have felt. Peter didn't feel like he belonged anymore. Peter probably didn't feel like he belonged to Jesus anymore. He didn't feel because he failed. But he, he, when, when, he, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he says, and Peter, go tell my disciple, and Peter, and Peter, meaning that whatever your failures are, Jesus is not given up on you. Go tell my disciple and Peter. Go tell my disciple and Kevin. Go tell my disciple and Annette. Go tell my disciple and Dwight. Go tell my disciple and Bettina. He hasn't given up on you. And Peter. Go tell my disciple and Peter. Jesus is inclusive. He's letting you know, Peter, I know that you deny me. I'm aware of it. As a matter of fact, Peter, I knew that you were going to deny me. Peter, I know what you're struggling with. I know what you're going through. I know what you've been through. And I knew it was going to happen, Peter, but you forget, Peter, that I prayed for you. This is the same Peter on the day of Pentecost who got up after he had Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This is the same Peter who denied Christ, who Jesus Christ forgave. And Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and preached, and multiple thousands got saved. This is the same bold, coward Peter who denied him when he was arrested. And if you look in society now, you know that when you're in trouble, many people, they'll follow you. And then they'll follow you when you're not in trouble. But as soon as you get in trouble, they're gone. They leave you alone. You're on your own. And they put up the two fingers and say, deuces. Don't know you, man. Too bad. Can't see you, but I wouldn't want to be you. And they run out on you. Jesus Christ know, Jesus Christ know all that you're going to do. He knows all about your faltering fate. He knows what your goals, what your present struggle is. And he's saying to you, I have not forsaken you. 
despite your messing up. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I want to let you know, don't give up. This is just a trying of your faith. Jesus Christ pray for you in John 17, 14 to 20. Jesus Christ pray for you. Look what Jesus, the Bible said, he prayed that he will keep you from the evil one. He prayed that the Father will sanctify you to his truth. Thy word is truth. Do you know that when Jesus Christ pray, he gets his prayers answered? He prayed for you. So my friend, I am telling you this morning, don't give up. Allow God, allow Jesus Christ, allow the process. Walk through the process. Walk through the temptation. And if you fail, get up and try again. And if you get knocked down again, keep getting up. Don't lie down. I want you to notice the Bible said, when the Bible tell you that the righteous fall seven times and rise it again, and the wicked fall but once and is forgotten, I want you to know that the person who is doing the right thing, he fall down more than the wicked. The emphasis is not placed on the fall. The emphasis is placed on what you do when you fall down. You get up. If you keep getting up, you're righteous. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I am righteous. I keep getting up. You can't keep me down. You might say, Pastor, but you don't know. Have you ever failed, Pastor? Sure I have. Pastor, you fail? Yes, many ways. I fail daily in words, in thoughts, and in deed. So yes, because we are men, we are women, we are frail. We are human beings. We fail in words, in thoughts, and in deed. I want you to know this. Whatever you're going through, whatever your fail, whatever your failures are, get up and try again. Don't lie down. Kick the devil. Kick the steward of the devil and say, you knock me down today, but you're not knocking. Even if you knock me down tomorrow, I will keep getting. I'm coming, Lord, one knee. You can't even get up on both foot yet, but pull up and pull yourself up on one knee and keep going again. I'm coming. I'm coming, Lord. I'm coming. Knock you down again. Get up again and keep trying. Knock you down again. Keep getting up and trying. Your faith, Jesus Christ, said, I pray that your faith fail not. Hear what he said. I want you to notice Jesus Christ's prayer. I pray that your faith fail not. He didn't say, I pray that you don't fail. Look at the scripture. He said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. He didn't say, I, don't, I pray that you didn't fail. He knew Peter was going to fail. But the foundation on which you stand, your faith in Jesus Christ, he's saying, Peter, you're going to fail. But I'm pray, I pray that your faith, your pistis, the pistis, the foundation, your moral, your, your, your spiritual, your, your, your spiritual conviction that you're believing, I'm praying that that don't fail. And because I pray, say, because I pray that faith, the Peter, I know my prayers have been answered. Because Jesus Christ, when he prayed, he said, Father, I know that you hear me all the time. And when Jesus Christ prayed for you, baby, you, his prayers are answered. So let me say to you this. Jesus Christ prayed for you. Not that you're not going to fail, that your faith mm -hmm, in Jesus Christ fail not. My brothers and sisters, have faith in God. The Bible talks about little faith. It talks about great faith. It talks about no faith. But it also talks about he has given to every man a measure of faith. So whatever measure of faith you have, my brother, my sister, get up. Tell the devil, not so. The devil will say, you're not righteous. He said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when he kept and when he kept, when he comes and, and tell you in your mind, I said, if you are righteous, you wouldn't do that. Tell him, God ain't finished with me yet. He's still working on me. I'm a work in progress. And when he get knocked down again, he said, you're not going to make it. Tell him, no, Jesus Christ, pray for me. I won't get up and I'm going to try. One of these days, I'm not going to fall anymore. One of these days, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to bring souls to Christ. I'm going to walk through. You're not going to be able to trick me every time with the same thing. And if you look at your life, most of the time when you fail, it's the same thing that the devil keep bringing up to you. The same where you, the areas where you're weak. So hear what your prayer should be. Lord, strengthen me in this area, Lord God. And when he find that the, God, the, Lord, the Lord strengthen you in that area, the devil use another tactic. He finds something is that you're weak in. All of us have weakness. He, he tempts you. And the Bible said he tempts you by the lust of the eye, the lust of the, the flesh, and the pride of life. Beauty, appetite, and ambition. That's what it is. The lust of the eye looks good. The pride of life, ambition. 
the lust of the flesh, food, appetite. So he tempts you with appetite, beauty, and ambition. And that's also in the Garden of Eden. The Bible said, and when the woman saw that the tree was good to look upon beauty and a desire to make one wise, ambition, and good for food, appetite, that's what he tempts you. He tempts you to appetite, beauty, and ambition. And when you feel that after a while, he can't tempt you with, 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 with beauty anymore. You don't appeal to me. Then he goes for ambition. I want to ask, I, I, like Peter, who's going to be the greatest? I want to get there. And then he tempts you with appetite. Not, not necessarily food. Food is the appetite, but it's not necessarily food. Sex is also an appetite. Tempt you to live a lascivious lifestyle. Live in sexual immorality. And after a while, when you get over it and that don't appeal to you anymore, he uses something. And with sexual immorality and lascivious lifestyle, it's the same thing. Different skirt, the same thing. She dressed differently. It's a different woman. She have the same thing. They'll tempt you. My brothers and sisters, when you fall, get up again. It doesn't mean that God discard you and he don't want you anymore. It's just a trying of your faith trying to see if you will really hold on to God and not give up. I want to say to you this morning, get up. Get up again. Try again. The trying of your faith work and patient. Then you get some experience from that. And you, you use that same experience to help someone who are going through. God has not forgotten you. He's not ignorant and didn't know that you were going to go through all of this. God, no, 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 no. God knew everything about you. He know all that you're going to go through. I want you to know this. So you might say, well, Pastor, I don't know, man, if I have that faith. Yes, you do. The very fact that you're on Zoom this morning listening to me telling you it's faith enough that you need Jesus, that you are a child of God. You could be doing so many other things, but this morning, you're on Zoom and look at you. Some of you I can see, some of you I can't see, but I wanna encourage you this morning. God is with you. Don't give up on your faith in Christ. Don't let the enemy steal your testimony. Hey, Kayla, hey, Jayad, hey, Saquon, don't give up. Hey, Sky, don't give up. You keep trying, keep fighting the good fight of faith. You keep laying hold of eternal life. Hey, Dwight, Hey, Bettina, lay hold of that thing, girl. Lay hold of it. You hold on to Jesus. Don't you let your Jesus go. Hey, Annette, don't you let your Jesus go. Hey, Arlette, don't let your Jesus go. You hold on to it. Hey, Jerua, hey, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to it. Whatever you go through, don't let go. And if you fall, keep getting up. And, and forget about the naysayers. There are always people out there who are going to criticize you. There are always people out there who are going to make you feel like you're not safe and tell you all kind of rubbish. Tell them, my actions, my deeds does not negate who I am. My action, my, my deeds don't tell you who I am. I am a child of God. Jesus Christ prayed for me. I have confessed Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Because of that, I am saved. The Bible said, for God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait until you get it right before he died for you. He died for you while you were still in your mess. And he's saying he paid for your sins, past, present, and future. And he said to Peter, Peter, you're going to mess up. I know you're going to mess up. I pray that your faith, Jesus Christ is saying, don't let your faith fail you. Anything else can fail, but you have faith in God. Don't let go of your faith in Jesus Christ. Hold on to God. He loves you with an everlasting love. My brothers and sisters, you've got a pastor here who loves you also. You have a pastor here who is not perfect. I have failed many times, but I hold on to my faith in Jesus Christ. And the enemy is going to come in a lot of different ways and try to tempt you, try to try your faith. But I want you to say this, I want you to know this. Jesus Christ prayed for you. Just like he prayed for Peter, he prayed for you in Matthew 17, he, in, in Luke 7, in John 17 rather, he has prayed for you. And I know that Jesus Christ 
gets his prayer answers every time, all the time, every day, morning, noon, and night. Whenever he prays, he gets his prayer answered. With that assurance, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor things present or things to come, principalities or power can ever separate me from the love of God. He loves me with an everlasting love. Because of that love that he has for me, I am persuaded and I am fully assured that I am saved. And so are you. Get up again and try. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I just have it in my spirit. I just sense that there's someone out there who need encouragement this morning. Get up and try again. And I want to tell you that, but Pastor, what if I try and fail again? So what? Keep getting up. Keep getting up. And if you fail a hundred times, keep getting up. If you fail a million times, keep getting up. But Pastor, no, keep getting up. Don't let your faith in Jesus Christ die. Hold on to your faith in him. When you falter, keep getting up. Do you believe it this morning? I pray that God bless you. I pray that as you go out this morning, that you face this week, whatever failure you look at, what, what, and whatever you did last night or the day before, whatever failure, forgive someone. Forgive them and encourage someone. Whatever you face this week, the Lord God who prayed for Peter, the Lord God who strengthens Peter, pray that his faith fail not. I want you to know again, I'm, I'm going to finish here, but I just want you to know what Jesus Christ prayed for. He said, I pray that your faith fail not. Anything else can fail. You can fail, Peter. You can fail. You're going to fail. But Peter, don't let your faith fail. Don't let the foundation on which you believe fail. Hold on to that, Peter. And trust me, you're going to get stronger. You know what he says, Peter? When you get strong, when you are converted, God is depending on you to strengthen someone. So don't lay down. Get up again. You have work to do. You have a friend, a relative, a family member, a co-worker to strengthen. Get up. Get up. If you lay down, you can't strengthen them. Get up again. Get up and try and strengthen your brethren. God puts it in you. He demands it of you. Get up and strengthen someone. Don't lay down. Try again. God bless you this morning. God keep you this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, thy people, O oh God, who have received your word. Father, I pray for them as their pastor, Lord God. I also pray, I come in agreement with you, Lord God, that your faith fail not. That Lord God, that when they are tried and they are tested, I also pray, I come in agreement with you, Lord God, that your faith fail not. I pray, Lord God, that you strengthen them in the inner man. That you strengthen them, Lord God, morally, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. That you strengthen them, Lord God, that you fortify them. And Lord, when their faith seems to be wavering, pop, prop them up on their leaning side, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, keep them as the apple of thine eye. Surround them, Lord God, with shields. Surround them, O oh God, with fiery flames to protect them from the evil one, Lord God. Father, I pray that you guide them this week as they go forward, that you sustain them, Lord God. The Spirit of the Lord be upon you, in you, around you, uphold you, comfort you, sustain you, and keep you this week. On all that you face this week, may the Lord fortify you and give you the grace and the strength to get up and keep trying. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, 
I want you to give a donation. The tie the Lord, the Brother Kevin, he put something up there um, for Cash App. We still, we, we go back in our building next week and um, we still have the beautiful building and we go back there next week to continue to worship. And I'm gonna go over there and just do what we need to do. I know that my I'm feeling well and my 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 I'm feeling very very good. I should get my I should get my um my result on Monday or sometime on Tuesday I think and um you know I should be okay. So we're aiming to go back there next Sunday to worship. And even though we go back next Sunday, we are aiming to go back next Sunday to worship. We while we're in the service, we will still have Zoom meeting because while we're in the church, we still log on to Zoom. But I'm asking you, support this ministry. Support this ministry. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. Send something through Cash App, to, to you know, and send, send an offering or a tag and support this ministry. We still have to pay the rent and the light bills and so do some things there. But I trust that you will hear the word of the Lord this morning and try again. God bless you all. God bless you. You have a wonderful week. And your pastor is looking to see some of you next week, God's willing.